Some claim that philosophy departments are hostile environments for women. Well, could they be right? Let's look at the evidence, coming up next on The Factual Feminist. In 2014, women earned 28% of the PhDs in philosophy. By contrast, they earned close to 60% in English, anthropology, sociology, 75% in psychology. When it comes to gender, philosophy looks more like math and physics. Well, a group of feminist philosophers is persuaded that women are being held back, kept away by rampant sexism, both overt and unconscious. And in the past few years, there's been a surge of tendentious and alarmist articles, blogs, studies on the precarious state of women in philosophy. There's even a song. <laughs> well, recently, some in this group have ascended to power in the American Philosophical Association, and they're hard at work addressing this alleged crisis. Now, I know that some of you are thinking, why should I care about what happens in the American Philosophical Association? Well, if you want to understand what's happening at colleges and universities today, you should pay close attention. In 2008, MIT feminist philosopher Sally Haslinger published an article in an academic journal where she lamented that philosophy is combative and judgmental. She called it a hyper-masculine environment. Now look, I was a philosophy professor, my husband was a philosophy professor, my stepson is a philosophy professor. I have been around a lot of philosophers. They are many things, but hypermasculine isn't one of them. Well, nonetheless, Haslinger was passionate, actually quite combative. She attacked analytic philosophy for favoring masculine terms such as penetrating, seminal, and rigorous. And she described this deep well of rage inside her, rage over how she and others had been treated. Now, Haslinger called on established feminists, that was her phrase, established feminists should organize and resist the masculinization of philosophy spaces. Now, Professor Haslinger expected a backlash. Instead, she ignited a hostile takeover. By 2013, she had attained a top position in the American Philosophical Association, and she wrote in the New York Times that her group's persistent activism is becoming institutionalized. Her article ended with these words. We are on the winning side now. We will not relent, so it's only a matter of time. <laughs> well, the factual feminist is concerned. Academic philosophy prides itself on logic, rules of evidence, and analytic rigor. But Haslinger and others on her winning side, they appear to be making their case by other means, dogma, misinformation, pop psychology. Well, let's begin with logic. This movement is premised on a double standard. It treats the philosophy gender disparity as self-evidently wrong, even tragic, according to Yale philosopher Josh Nob. But much larger disparities that favor women in fields like sociology, anthropology, psychology, even veterinary medicine, these are ignored. But if disciplines with more men are ipso facto unjust, then how can fields with more women be acceptable? To be consistent, the activists should be calling for gender parity across the curriculum. Now, this APA-sponsored poster is turning up in philosophy departments. Well, maybe departments should have posters like these with psycho bros or psychologies or anthropologies. <laughs> the movement also ignores the finding, consistently documented by a vast empirical literature, that on average, men and women tend to have somewhat different interests. For example, a large study of mathematically gifted youth found that males are more likely to have strong interests in investigative and theoretical pursuits. But mathematically gifted females, on the other hand, were more likely to show preferences for social and artistic pursuits. Now, these are just patterns holding on average, and we should be careful not to overgeneralize. But this research helps explain why different fields show different ratios of men to women as in these numbers indicating majors at Princeton University. When the New York Times invited five feminist philosophers to discuss the gender gap in 2013, not one of them entertained the possibility that women might tend to find other subjects more interesting. Instead, the groups talked exclusively about things like male privilege, harassment, and stereotypes. But plenty of other fields in which women are now outperforming men once had stereotypes and harassment, if these weren't barriers to women elsewhere, why is philosophy different? Well, let's turn away from anecdotes and distorted logic and consider a few facts. First, 
It makes sense that women received only 28% of the philosophy PhDs in 2014 because in the same year they received only 29% of undergraduate degrees in philosophy. Why so few female majors? Well, to find out, Australian researchers conducted a survey of students in their most popular introductory class at the University of Sydney. Now, the female students were less likely to pursue philosophy than the men, but not because they were put off by the argumentative style or a hostile environment. Rather, it was because they were just less interested in the field from the start. And that didn't change when the professor focused on women in the coursework or always used female pronouns. Now, second point. Philosophy departments are not biased against women in hiring. There may be fewer women interested enough in philosophy to pursue it as a career, but those who do are more likely to get jobs. According to a study by the APA between 2012 and 2015, other things being equal, female PhDs were 65% more likely than men to find a permanent academic job within two years of graduating. And look at the APA itself. Over the past five years, women have held about 60% of its top offices. For 2016, women held all the top positions. It's difficult to see how a profession that hires women at a higher rate than it hires men, that awards women its top leadership positions, it's hard to see how it's rigged against women. Without pushback, this movement could mire academic philosophers in, in divisive gender politics for years and actually scare women away. I mean, the way the activists describe philosophy is hypermasculine, unsupportive, filling women with rage. Why would any woman want to enter such a field? In my senior year of high school, my mother gave me a copy of Bertrand Russell's History of Western Philosophy. And I relished that book. But it was written by a man. It was all about men like Plato, Aristotle, Descartes, Nietzsche. But I thought it was written for me. I wasn't aware that I had entered some kind of unsafe, hypermasculine space. To me, it felt like sacred space. And I pursued a BA and PhD in philosophy and taught it for more than 20 years. It never crossed my mind, not in high school or as my academic career progressed, that I would be unwelcome because I was a woman. Well, I'm glad that today's grievance blogs and alarmist theories and tirades, I'm glad they weren't around then to discourage me. And I'm sorry to think of their influence today on young women who are drawn to this great and challenging calling. Well, let me know what you think of what's going on in philosophy. If you are a philosophy student or a professor and the APA is up to some mischief, let me know. And uh, please leave your comments below. And if you enjoyed this episode, follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and subscribe to the series. Thank you for watching The Factual Feminist.